And so today we got an introduction to isometry, which are transformations that preserve distances. So anything that we can do to the plane in particular that makes it so the distance between two points before agrees with the distance between the images of those two points after. So we saw four different results. The first, um, guaranteeing for us that these three types of transformations are invertible. So if I rotate um, the whole plane about a rotocenter P by an angle of theta, that we can undo that, we can invert it by re-rotating by the opposite of that angle, just by rotating back in the other direction. Um, and to prove that, we had to use what is the characterization, what is the definition of a rotation in the first place. So the definition of a rotation is what we're seeing here in this line, that what it means in a coordinate free way to rotate a point x about the center p by an angle of theta is it means that, first of all, the angle x p x prime, where x prime is the image of that rotation, that that angle is equal to theta, but that also x is the same distance away from that rotational center as its image is. So we also have a congruency of these two um, segments. So. Um, I think that was the hardest part about a lot of what we did today is understanding when we're thinking about rotations, reflections, and translations, how to define those things without resorting to using coordinate um, and analytical geometry and to do it in a coordinate-free way. So it turns out that these two requirements are enough to define for us what a rotation is and enough for us to then be able to prove that to undo that rotation, we just have to do another rotation about the same center using the opposite of the angle that we had before to rotate back. So we did that by taking x prime, which was the rotation of x, and re-rotating it back to a third point, which we call x double prime. And then we just have to show that x double prime is the same as x. Because if that's true, then our, uh, rot our rotation of min minus theta exactly undoes what the rotation by theta did. So we did that just by showing that x and x prime are the same distance away from p, which we did by uniting these two algebraic equations. So x and x prime are the same distance from p. And they also make the same directed angle uh, through p uh, to x prime. So they both lie on the same circle centered at p. Um, and they make the same, or they're, they're both the termini of the same arc that has the uh, congruent angle um, starting from x prime. And therefore, x and x double prime are the same point. And so one rotation undoes the other. Um, that was probably the most intricate of the arguments here. Um, but when we go forward in talking about reflections and translations, again, we have to resort to using the original definitions of what those things are without resorting to using coordinate geometry. So we can define a reflection about uh, a line L using the perpendicular bisector property that reflecting about the line L means that L is the perpendicular bisector between that point and its image. And then we just have to use the fact that if I rotate, sorry, if I reflect twice using the very same line of reflection, the same mirror, that that same mirror is the perpendicular bisector both of x x prime and x prime x double prime. But it's not possible for one line to be the perpendicular bisector of two segments um, unless those segments are related together by a translation. But because these two segments share a common vertex, um, they must be exactly the same segment, and it means that x, the other vertex, and x double prime are the same point. So to undo a reflection, just do the same reflection again, and you get back where you started. And then likewise for a translation, if my translation moves a point A to a point B, then to undo that translation, I should use a translation which moves the point B back to the point A, which sounds like there's not any information content there. But of course, what's important to remember is that an isometry doesn't just move those two points, it moves the entire plane. So the real question is, if I move A to B, that moves the entire plane in a certain way. Why is it that if I move B back to A, that the entire plane moves back to where it started? And so we make that argument using the original definition of a translation, which says that the translation from A to B is going to move any point X to a point X prime, which is the same distance away from B as X was from A. So we have a pair of congruent segments. And also that those segments are parallel to one another. And so what that sets up for us is a parallelogram. X, X prime, A, B. Um, and then if we apply T, A, B and we go backwards, we're going to get another point X double prime 
which also makes a parallelogram with x prime a and b. And so we end up with two parallelograms that have three of their vertices in common, which forces them to have their fourth vertex in common. And so x is equal to x double prime. So each of these transformations is invertible, and we can say specifically what its inverse is. And that's going to be important because we're going to find out that these are the only building blocks of isometries um, that exist. They're the only ones we need to care about. So in our next proof, um, we did see some ways of going at this next proof using coordinate geometry. Um, what, what we're proving next is that um, rotations, reflections, and translations are, in fact, isometries. So they preserve distance. We can prove these things using coordinates if we, first of all, know how to compute distances in a coordinate system, which usually comes in the form of a, a distance formula, like the one we see here, which works on the Cartesian coordinate plane. Um, and then we also need to know how to characterize these various transformations using coordinate geometry. So for example, we can characterize the translation, um, which moves this point here, A, to this point here, B. It turns out that we can define it just by the formula TAB of XY is equal to X plus HY plus K for some constants H and K. In other words, to translate uh, the XY plane in the coordinate system, we just have to add a constant to the X variable and add a constant to the Y variable. And that achieves the translation, and every translation can be written that way. But that's a broad claim to make, and so we would need to establish that before we could really use coordinate geometry. But if we could, then it would be a straightforward algebra computation to show that after translation, the distance between these two points remains the same as it was before, because, for example, the plus h's are going to wipe out and the plus k's are going to wipe out because we're subtracting them before we square them in the distance formula. But our burden of proof uh, in this course, almost always, is to avoid using coordinate geometry, uh, geometry arguments uh, to the sense that we can because they're so limiting. They require us to have a coordinate system and to play by its rules. Um, but we have a different set of definitions. So when we had to prove that these things were isometries, we had to return to the original definitions of what rotations, reflections, and translations were. To prove that rotations were isometries, we had to show um, that the distance from P to Q is the same as the distance from P prime to Q prime. And to do that, we ended up constructing a congruence argument about triangles, as we so often do, um, using the triangle OPQ and OP prime Q prime. Now, the very definition of a rotation guarantees for us that OP and OP prime are congruent segments and also guarantees that OQ and OQ prime are congruent segments. So we have a pair of congruent sides. All we need in order to guarantee congruency of these triangles is then congruent angle that joins those sides. And so we had to do a little bit of algebra to justify why the angle here, POQ, and the angle here, P prime OQ prime, were congruent. We didn't know that up front, but a little bit of algebra showed us that this was the case um, because we knew that POP prime and QOQ prime were both equal to theta. But then once we had those congruencies, SAS got us home. Uh, SAS guaranteed those two triangles were the same, and because the triangles were the same, their corresponding sides, PQ and P prime Q prime, were congruent, which makes this rotation an isometry. Ditto for reflections and translations, although we had to use slightly different tools for each of these. For uh, reflections, we first of all set up the line L as the perpendicular bisector of the segments x, x prime and y, y prime, the segments joining each of those two points to its image under this reflection. From there, we needed to again make some arguments about congruent triangles, which we started by divvying what looks like a trapezoid. We're going to actually prove that it's a trapezoid. Um, but divvying this quadrilateral up into a pair of triangles by connecting y to o, the place where l meets the uh, segment from x to x prime. And then by definition of reflection of y across this line, we get equality, congruence of those segments, as well as a 90 degree angle right here, which makes a 90 degree angle right over there. And so we have a side and an angle, and then also a shared side to give us side angle side congruence of this set of triangles, which then gives me congruence of this remaining side. So SAS gave us the congruence of, of those pair of triangles. And then running this through one more time, we have congruence, again, by definition of reflection of these two sides. And the angle in between them can be said to be congruent by 
using the alternate uh, opposite interior angle theorem, 1.3.2, which tells us that this angle and this angle are congruent to one another. But we knew that those angles were congruent to these angles because those were congruent triangles in the first place. And so all that whole set of four angles is congruent, giving me congruency of these remaining triangles and therefore congruency of the sides that we really cared about, x, y, and x prime, y prime. And then finally for translation, um, because translation involves this notion of parallelism, we very often end up setting up parallelograms to prove things about translations as isometries. Um, so when we translate A to B, and x and y come along with them to x prime, y prime, we get a pair of parallelograms. Um, x, x, A, B, x prime is a parallelogram. x, y, uh, sorry, uh, y, A, y, y, A, B, y prime is a parallelogram. But the most important par parallelogram that we end up with in that process is this one, x, y, x prime, y prime. And we know it's a parallelogram because by very definition of translation, x, x prime and y, y prime are congruent parallel sides. And theorem 2.3.5 says that any quadrilateral, simple quadrilateral, with a pair of congruent parallel sides is a parallelogram. And because opposite sides of a parallelogram are congruent by the same theorem, x, y is equal to x prime, y prime. Whew. A lot of content in that one. Um, and definitely one worth chewing over because it, again, gets right to the heart of how we define these various transformations. So the last thing that we did was we worked toward the proof that a, uh, an isometry sends straight lines into straight lines. The image of a straight line is always a straight line. We first did that by showing that collinearity is preserved. And collinearity is preserved under an isometry merely because of the triangle inequality, which is our main tool for detecting when a triplet of points is collinear. So if I start with a pair of three collinear points, P, Q, and R, then they satisfy this equation according to the triangle inequality. But their images under an isometry, because isometries preserve distances, will satisfy the same equation, which therefore, again by the triangle inequality, implies that those three image points are collinear. And the same argument works in reverse as well. So there's no way for a isometry to either create or destroy collinearity. Three points which are collinear will remain collinear under an isometry, and likewise, three non-collinear points will remain non-collinear. And that collinearity extends, therefore, also to the entirety of straight lines. An entire straight line will have a straight line as its image under an isometry. Which leads us to our, our big finish of the day, which is that an isometry will make a congruent copy of a triangle for us, that's part one, um, and that as a result, um, it will make a congruent copy of any angle at all in geometry. And the key to this proof is to plug in the result that we just saw about collinearity um, to say that, first of all, the image of a triangle under an isometry will remain a triangle because P, Q, and R not being collinear will imply that their images are not collinear. So 7, 2, 3 guarantees that part for us. And the congruency part, we just need to use the definition of an isometry, which tells us that PQ is going to be congruent to P prime Q prime. Um, PR is going to be congruent to P prime R prime. And then QR will be congruent to Q prime R prime. So how do we know that these triangles are congruent? Well, all three of their sides are congruent, and therefore the triangles are congruent. And so we end up with a triple S uh, argument here because of the preservation of, of lengths inherent in an isometry. And because the entire triangle remains congruent when we apply an isometry to it, in particular, any one of its angles will have its measure preserved by an isometry as well, which guarantees for us that isometries always preserve angles. And so this last line in our classification table is justified, that any isometry, by virtue of preserving distances, will necessarily also preserve angles, according to 7.2.4. The reverse is not true, however, because as we argued at the beginning of the hour, dilations are an example of a what we call a similarity transformation, which preserves the angles but does not have to preserve distances.